Hey everybody, welcome back to Guitar in the Real World. It's been a while since I've done anything. Um, I've had a very busy few months involved in other projects, um, which uh, required quite a lot of my attention and time. Anyway, um, one of the things I was doing was finishing up and releasing my little EP called Eclipse. My prog rock epic in four parts. So, um, my friend Andy Phillip, who we've seen on a previous uh, episode talking about nylon string tone production, actually suggested that he interview me so that I could talk a little bit about the process involved in making the uh, EP. So, I hope this will be of interest to some of you. Um, it was a very different way of working for me, and I think I probably learned quite a lot from the process. So, yep, yeah, here's me talking to Andy uh, sometime last week. Talking about uh, about this, I wanted to um, I wanted to start talking to you about this uh, album mostly because I noticed a little funny thing that your last couple of recordings were done very much in a band setting. Yeah, this one is done obviously from home. Most of all, it's, it's a home studio sort of mm. workout. Um, and yet you've actually embraced probably quite a rockier sound than you've done before. And you've turned the gain up. You've, you've almost sort of approached it more in the environment where you would think, ah, oh, right, finally, you've got no neighbours, you've got no anything, you're going to actually... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that's the, wonders of, that's the wonders of DIing your guitar, isn't it? In well, the modern it. era. <laughs> It can be as, as noisy as you want. <laughs> that's it, that's it. But there's obviously something about the fact that you wanted to embrace that that more sort of slightly earthier, slightly rockier sound. Is that based on what you've been listening to or is that just a... a is it, was it a conscious thing or was it just a... No, it was very subconscious. Um, you see, initially I didn't, I, didn't, um, I didn't really have an idea of... Uh, when I started it, I didn't actually have a, um, a concept to you know, an overarching concept. I'd actually yeah. recorded the piece called Sunrise first. And yes. it had started with just a free improvisation on electric guitar to a click track. So right. the initial version of it was, it was a bit kind of wobbly and it wasn't particularly well played. <laughs> in fact, the, re, the, re, the redone version is still a bit wobbly in places in my, my... But basically, I had that guitar part, which I then built on top of with the bass and the acoustic guitar and the percussion. Yeah. And, um, and I thought, oh, I quite like this as a, as a way of working just cause it's giving, it's giving me kind of a different aesthetic, I think, uh, which, so it was, that was kind of totally accidental. So I just thought, oh, well, I'll just work in the same way rather than writing stuff down on paper, which I normally do. I thought I was going to improvise some ideas. And so right. it became a more of a patchwork quilt thing. So the next piece that I worked on was um, the thing that opens it, actually. Um, oh, yeah. Sunspots, yeah. And I think I started with the bass line for that. I, I know. So I know what I did was I put together the percussion part, which was oh. like the detuned de bongos and rim, you know bongo rims and yes. all played with the drumsticks. Um, and... Uh, so that gave me a groove, and then I just sort of played this quite rocky bass line, which I totally improvised. Which and, and as a result of being totally improvised, rhythmically it's kind of got an unpredictability about where the phrase, on its repeat, it, instead of coming in on beat two of the next or beat one, it goes to beat two. So the res the rhythmic resolution is different, even yeah. though there's a certain repetitiveness about it. So, and then I had the sort of B section, which I think I just repeated. I just recorded separately. So I did like the A section. I thought, oh, I quite like that. And then I did the, the B section. And then thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll sort of find a complementary guitar riff to go over the top of it. So yeah. that was the next thing I did. And that was just the double stops with the open E string. And it happened to create essentially the movement of sus2 chords. Um, yeah. And then it landed on a C over F chord, which is a very typical kind of chord for me because it's very steely danny. But it was it was kind of completely accidental that that was the chord that it landed on at the end yeah. of those four bars. And after that, I just sort of started to build up. Um, I think I, built, 
then worked on like the B section, the acoustic thing, because I think I, yeah, I'd come up with that, that three note repeated thing on the strap up high and then just repeat it. Yeah. I thought, well, that's, that's a kind of a hemiola thing, which I can then turn into 12 A. So I just, I just took each idea as it came along and yes. developed it with a new texture. I think that's kind of what yeah. I did with that one. No, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. And, um, I mean, with because I remember hearing an early version of Sunspots mm. you sent over with with the percussion down. But did you always hear it with the drums on it as well, or was it almost just again just sort of well, I'm just going to work with what I've got and then I'll build it up later on? Or? Actually, the idea was to not have drums on any of it. Right. Um, and I think by the time I'd written the last bit, the um sunset um the uh it it just felt like it needed drums on that one i just thought i could do percussion i think i just put i did it with did it to did sort of a drum loop i sort of recorded <laughs> most of the parts uh, and so i added i then went back and added the drum loop onto sunspots just to see how it sounded and i thought you know it just got so much with a real drummer on it it will have so much more weight and impact so i thought um, although my idea was to do it as a completely solo project, I think the music um, would benefit from that. I also, you know, I was trying to limit myself anyway in order to get it done, and it was going to be like one guitar sound effectively right. for the whole thing. And, <laughs> but as as it expanded, I thought, okay, li limitation is great. is actually a really good way of cr forcing creativity. But if it was obvious to me, if the obvious solution to a, a part was to use a much heavier sound or use a cleaner sound or or use a different guitar, then that obvious solution I would go with because my instincts were telling me that's what it had to be. Yes, so yes, most yes. of it was that, that black strat up there. Right, okay. Almost all of the electric stuff. But I think the outro solo on the sunset, I think... So I can't even remember now because I tried different things. I think that was on my telly, actually, okay. my okay. sir. But it's quite gainy. But it's yeah. it's quite I quite like that tone though. It, it seems to work, you know. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it was very much the. There's a sort of Hendersony sort of sound mm. to a lot of it. Um, I think actually one thing I noticed. I was going to go back to the drums, but I'll carry on with this anyway. Um, is I haven't used you heard you use. The vibrato arm, or the tremolo arm, or whatever you want to mm. call it, the wang bar, yeah. anything like as much as you did in this one. Again, not so much in the solo, but in a lot of the rhythm playing, it seems that there's just quite a lot of subtle sort of manipulation of the tremolo. Yeah. Um, and again, I suppose it's just that thing of whether just embracing having a different guitar in front of you rather than a 335. Yeah, I think... Thing. I mean, I, I was never, I was never anybody who used the whammy. I, you know, I think when I started out, I, I used to try and use it just to emulate a bit of Hank Marvin wobble. But then I, I just never, because I didn't do the 80s shred thing, you know, I didn't listen to, I didn't listen to Satriani or Vi or, or Eddie back then at all. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't really on my radar. And I was more into, I just got into players who played like, you know, jazz der derived rock you know yeah. so it was larry carlton and i mean i know scott henderson has always been a bit of a whammy user he definitely got into it more and later in life but yeah. um but i you know i thought the uh yeah i think i've embraced the whammy as a, as a textural thing as i've got older because i i think i used to be scared of using it using it because i didn't feel like i had the confidence in my technique to to have this extra thing to worry about yeah. now i sort of don't worry about that so stuff so much so i think it needs some movement especially with chords sometimes yeah. and i think it's just a nice way especially when you've got a lot of delay there because it creates a nice um kind of a pad without yeah. actually being a pad a chorus without having to have a chorus pedal on sort of thing it gives that yeah. a bit of um bit of movement and um no, it's it's nice. I mean, I noticed it particularly. It's 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 a nice way of giving a bit of texture to the rhythmic playing. You know, particularly I think on yeah. um, Sunrise, I think there's quite a bit of just that sort of um, whammy esque. You know. Yeah, which of course that was that was the one where where I essentially totally improvised that that part, and then I I did go back and rep and uh, replace 
all of it. And it was it was really weird trying to play it tidily, but maintain the vibe that I had yeah. because I got quite a good vibe with the first version of it. And I ended up chopping it about and moving it to get it more in time. Once there was other things there, I ended up re-recording, you know, the bass and the, guitar, the acoustic guitars. I ended up re-recording them. And then I re went back to re-record the lead part. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I was, I tried to be careful not to sort of sanitize it and make it yeah. sound like, because I think I could have done that if I wasn't careful. So I just thought, no, I'll, I'll just try and play with as much vibe as I can, but be aware of, playing it as tidily as I can at the same time. So, you know, it isn't perfect, um, but uh, I, yeah, I just wanted it, I wanted it to sort of maintain that sense of freedom, I think. Yeah. I mean, it's something that I've, you know, I've been very guilty of with, with all my work, I, either as a freelance player or as a creative artiste. Um, I've sometimes gone, been so uptight about being accurate that, my yeah. playing has sort of lost any sense of freedom or flow. And um, a few weeks ago, I don't know if you saw that Kurt Rosenwinkel thing where he was playing with a, like a multiple big band type of orchestra thing. Right. Um, if you haven't seen it, check it out. I can't even remember what it is, but it appeared on Facebook and I, I sort of, I, I actually got Jill and the boys to sit and watch it. And, and I said to Jill, you know, I said, uh, yeah, I said, how do you, what do you, what do you notice about Kurt's playing? Right. And she said, she said, well, it seems very free. And I said, that's exactly what I think. Yeah. And he plays with imperfections, but he has a real sense of freedom with his playing. Do you know yeah. what I mean? I do know what you mean, yeah. yeah it's yeah. very kind of uninhibited. Mm. Um, and he, when he was younger, his playing was much more, he was still actually quite free and he still had that facility, but it, um, I'm not saying his playing sounds less tidy, but I think he just sounds freer than it did then. He's obviously taken that as a thing to really try and work with. And I thought yeah. that's a, that was an interesting thing, particularly for me, because I think I have neglected to allow freedom in my playing in the past. So that's what well, I was probably, trying to go I mean, it's probably, you know, it, it's more apparent to oneself as well when you are recording in your own studio environment, because there aren't the other people. I mean, you, 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 know, you don't have that thing of you're doing a take with other people and whatever you've put down, well, that sort of has to be it mm. because you liked what they did. Yeah. The problem is you've always got the option to go back. And it's, it's, I suppose it's that thing of knowing, do you have a, a set way of, not a set way of knowing how to, um, but just a way of limiting yourself to saying, that's enough. I don't need to do another one. Do you have a certain mod modus operandi of almost saying, well, I'll go away for half an hour. I, or I have to leave it for days sometimes. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the outro solo at the very end, I mean, that was about take 10 <laughs> or, or, or a bit of take nine, a bit of take 10. And yeah. in the end, it was like, I, I tried comping something together and, and Jill said to me, you know, that does, doesn't sound coher coherent, cohesive. Mm. I said, yeah, you're right. So I just went, right, let's just, I think I used like a big chunk and then I changed to it. And she said, that just sounds better. Even though yeah. to my ears, it wasn't as nicely played or whatever. And I thought, yeah, you're right. I should just leave it like that. And um, it's, it's funny when you're making your own music, I think trying to make, um, it's got, I think it's really hard to, to, uh, hard to articulate, but I, I have a particular problem with making a judgment about something's artistic value um, based on its artisticness or its, its expression and yeah. trying to not worry about the, whether it's technically well executed mm. or that that's one battle that I have to have. The other battle is, am I not hearing the artistic or, or so the, am I not hearing that statement as being, as being, as being valid simply because it has come from me? Yes. You know what I mean? It's like, am I judging its value based on the fact that it's come from me rather than in its own terms? Yes. And I, that, they're the two things that are really hard to, to do when you're sort of a self-producing, when you're creating your own music and, and being the, the, the arbiter of it all. Because, um, you know, you, your tendency will be to, even if it's good, to listen to it from a negative standpoint first. Yeah. Well, I mean, I always think there's an element of, of, of that that, you know, a lick that you're used to, let's say, 
you're used to hearing yourself play it every single day when you're practicing and you think, oh God, everybody, I'm sick to death of that league. And you play it and you think, oh God, I can't put that in there. Nobody else knows. Yeah, I mean, exactly. You know, when you've been practicing at home, you know, it could still sound fresh. I mean, interestingly enough, that's one of the other things that I've started to embrace is my own personal vocabulary. I have my own personal vocabulary. I mean, and, and I have my own identity. I think, you know, I think I can hear that it's, I know, because I know it's me, I know it's me. But what I'm saying is, I think from a playing and a writing and a production point of view, I think my music sort of has an identity to it. Whether it's a good identity or a bad identity, it, that isn't what I'm saying. It's a question of, it just sounds like me. Yeah, and yeah. I have to just embrace the fact that it sounds like me, regardless of whether it's any good or not. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I, the, the other thing I just wanted, when we're talking about freedom, it sort of brings me back to getting Alan involved mm. with the kit. Which is, I mean, how much did you dictate to him what you wanted, mm. or did you simply just send it and just say, just do whatever you? I, I want. sent it to him with like the basic sort of drum loop thing on it. And yeah. I just said, you know, do what you want with it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I keep getting distracted. I keep getting text messages from people that are just completely unexpected. But <laughs> they, they can wait, though. Um, um, sorry, the question was, yeah, Alan. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I sent it all to him and I just said, you know, do, do come up with parts that you think are going to yeah. fit. Um, but when it came to recording, obviously, um, I was there in the studio with him doing it. I see. And uh, so <clears throat> we talked a little bit about... There, there was, there, I only intervened at a couple of points with regards to, right, you, you're coming in a bar early there, but I actually want that bar of space before the drums come in. That was by, you know, things like that, which which is in sunspots when it comes back into the heavy section. Yes, yes. I, I had the drums coming in a bar later than the bass. I see, yeah. Um, da -da 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 when he, he'd learnt it as... So he had to sort of... It took a bit of a while to him to reprogram himself because I didn't want him playing in that bar. But he hadn't seen that that was an intentional thing. I think he'd have just... He just saw that as the way it happened. So my, my kind of... Dictating to him was basically um, things like that. There was another thing. I mean, there's a couple of things that he did. Uh, yeah, we had to work a little bit on like the middle, there's the, the first sort of sparse section in Sunset, where it yes. was the clean guitars. He'd come up with some stuff where he was putting too many pushes in, and I had I... to get him to strip it back a bit. <laughs> um, and then I think the the fact that there's but the end section of that has got the kind of three against four thing. Yes. He's playing like a Motown snare throughout, which disguises, yeah. which disguises the, disguises the three against four thing. In retrospect, mm. I think I would have preferred him to just play a backbeat because I wanted to make more of it. But on the mm. day we sort of went with that and yeah. he'd chosen to, he'd he, initially he'd chosen to phrase it in threes. And it was like, well, no, I actually want to hear the four. I want to hear the drums playing four yeah. against yeah. the three, four slash three, three bar cycle. Um, so I did get him to sort of not accentuate that so much, but because of playing the, the, the Motown snare, it didn't, dis, it, sorry, it disguised that more than I probably um, conceived in the first place. That said, you know, it's like if I had it at the time, my time all over again, I might say, yeah, stick to a backbeat. But I tend to be very flexible with people interpreting my own music. If they want to play something a particular way, unless it goes totally against the grain of my initial concept, I'll just go, yeah, let's do that then. I, I don't really believe in dictating too much. If I was doing like a commercial project and, you know, when I've been doing these library things, I've been a little bit more dictatorial, but even then I've gone, you know what, it's not what I had in mind, but it works. So well, I tend to it. find um, when I often, when I sort of am writing things, I'll often think of a player that I want rather than think of a part that I want. Yeah. But, and so often it's very much just, I want somebody who plays a bit like this, mm on this thing and then after that you just let them get on with it that's yeah. almost certainly in, in the sort of more jazz and improvised world mm. 
That yeah. seems rather than thinking, I know the sort of thing they'll do, so I'll write it all out for them and then get them to do my version of them. Yeah. You know, I yeah. often think, just, 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 just what I want is you. Just be you. I mean, that, that's why I asked Alan to do it, actually, because there's a sort of... I, I wanted it... I wanted his kind of sensibility. I could have asked a whole load of other drummers who would all be great in their own way, but I sort of knew that the way he plays was what I needed on that thing. Yeah. So that's... Find, did, did, did having the drums on there make you go back and revisit any of your own parts sort of afterwards? Only the outro solo, because the, the outro solo that, I, that I, he played over was just a sort of a dummy, me messing about, just to sort of have something to play with. It was never yeah. meant to be... I, it's really badly played, but I put I put in a load of stuff that was that was just a bit silly, loads of legato, fast notes, all out of time, load of old rubbish, most of it. Um, but I just I just wanted to give a sense of excitement for him to play with, and then I would go back and and re-record something, hence ten takes later, because I was never happy with it. <laughs> um, and I was, you know, I did, I did experiment with tone quite a bit for that because I, I went, I tried a much heavier kind of almost mushy over, over the top plexi sound, you know, where, right. where it's old fashioned, but mushed out and then, yeah. you know, bridge pickup, neck pickup, or I'll go for a JCM tighter Marshall sound. Yeah, maybe that's right. I'll try the telly. I tried the telly with a sort of clean sound. I tried the telly with a cleanish sound and uh, with the te- using the telly, I think... I can't remember what, what the actual tone was at the end, but I think it might have been like a JCM kind of modern Marshall sound with the neck yeah. pickup of the telly. I think that's what it was. It sounds a bit, the way I mixed it, I boosted a few frequencies, which made it a bit more in your face than it, mm. than it sounded. I mean, I'm wondering whether it might be a bit too in your face, too in your face retrospective. But again, you know, that's the the whole technical side of it where I don't really know what I'm doing and I'm just sort of guessing a lot of the time and t- using that, that dangerous little bit of knowledge that I have to make bad decisions. <laughs> but it's, it's, I mean, no, I think the tones all came across really well on the, on the whole thing. And actually, I mean, I, I'm still, I'm still amazed with what's with digital processing now, what's possible in terms of how live and how, good you know i mean it used to be getting an overdrive sound to work just plug straight in was almost impossible and now it, i really i i know there'll be people think that it's sacrilege for me to say but it ain't it's not sacrilege but it's almost like it's actually you can get a much better sound just by plugging something digital than you can by going through all the effort of micing up and all you know you can spend time well i i've it. thought quite hard about this for the home setup i thought well you know do i get like a, a load box so that i can Run my amp and then be like, but I was thinking if I want to go for some of those super heavy sounds, like if I wanted to, you know, get a a Bogner Uber shell yes, type yeah. of sound, am I really going to plug my two rock in with a load box with some kind of heavy pedal going into that? I'll then spend ages trying to get that to sound right. It's just like I'll just use the Bogner sound on the Axe Eight for that yeah. part. That maybe for lead parts I would do it differently. Yeah. Um, it all depends on what kind of a sound you're going for. But I actually think that um, I have found I've got a couple of patches on the axe that work incredibly well for those mid gain, yeah. mid to high ish gain sounds like the Marshall type of sounds. Yeah. yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and another thing that I've, I've taken to doing is I've, I use the, the there's a model of the Sir Badger amp which is like a modern Marshall. It's like a tighter version of a Plexi. If I stick a decent overdrive pedal on the input, so it's already a bit, a bit saturated before it goes in, sounds amazing. Yeah. You know, it's so just like... You're using, you're using a mixture of sort of outboard analog pedals going into a digital modeler, is that sort of your... Um, yeah, I mean, it's... Basically, um, for this, I used my um, Keely modified blues driver. Right going in and, and then I think a lot of it was into the clean twin sound but I used the badger for some stuff and right. and and then the pedal if I needed more gain and sometimes I did just use like the Bogner patch or the 
Marshall JCM 800 patch in yeah. the end. In the end, even though I was not going to do that, I just thought, this is what it needs. This is what I'm going to, these are the sounds I'm going to use. Um, and then, yeah, and, and it sort of, I think it works. I'm a bit dubious about some of the sort of sonic, uh, not so much the sonic character, but, but I'm a bit dubious about the way a couple of the bits sound. I think they might sound, I'm, I worry, don't worry, but I, I wonder if they sound a bit empty when I've tried to go for a contrast, but maybe it sounds all right. I don't, I don't know. I think, I mean, so many of the things, the thing that I think I've said this before, um, I think when you're listening back to your own playing, you can, you can hear almost, I can still hear in my own playing, I can hear just when my finger didn't quite, just felt a little bit uncomfortable on the string or something like that. Now, I don't think anybody else can hear that yeah. because I can remember the physical sensation of playing. Yeah. It makes me go, it's like, oh, that's, there's something wrong there, there's mm. something wrong there. Now, these are things that, Actually, nobody else would notice because they weren't aware of. But of course, when you hear when when I listen to let's say this EP you've just recorded, I hear essentially this thing in my ears, and maybe even you know a vision of the artwork on a computer screen. When you hear it, an awful lot of the embedded memory that you have is of you sitting down in your room. You can picture the microphone in front of you, or you can picture the the guitar going into the thing. So your your whole memory is a bit like you know everything we do you can remember where you were when you were doing it so of course yeah. your whole picture of it is so vastly different from other people just hear this world that's being yeah. created you still hear the the strands yes you know. well i think um i think the only way to sort of train yourself to get better at dealing with that is to just do it and i've done so much recording throughout lockdown whether it be for myself or for other projects and if only I could say it's earned me a living over that period as well. Most, most of it hasn't. But I have been recording myself so much. Mm. And I haven't been practicing the technical side of the guitar very much at all. But I've been having to listen to myself in context all the time. Yeah. And, I, and I think I'm, I'm more willing to accept that I will always hear those problems. Yeah. Um, what I t what are the other thing that I'm trying to get better about is, especially when I'm producing stuff that's supposed to be a bit more clinical in its production, is the sort of timing accuracy because you can see it on the grid. Yeah. And course, yeah. and what I'm trying to do now is like not get hung up on that and just listen with closed eyes. And if there's something that still sticks out at me, it's like right, I will need to move something because I can hear it so obvious, and it's like I just working on, on one of these tracks for this library album mm. my yacht rock album and oh. um i finally got the piano back for one of them and there's this one bit where i'd played you know as a lead on the lead part i'd played like a phrase and it's just like on the grid it's actually in time but yeah. because of the way that everybody else has phrased i'm noticeably not fitting with everybody else Whereas if I did listen to me with with the grid, that bit would have been all right, but other bits of my performance wouldn't be all right. Of so, I've you know, I do get a bit over go a bit over the top with that sort of thing sometimes. But and when maybe I should just try and play better, I don't know. But you know what? Studying other people's playing, you realise that nobody plays perfectly on the grid for for three or four minutes. No, I I think I think you can drive yourself mad with the grid. I think, mm. and I, you know, I, I still go back to, I think if you, I mean, you know, I, I, the number of albums that you could listen to from the 50s or 60s or something like that, if you put a grid against them, you'd be all over the you place. You know what, not even 50s or 60s. I, I put, I put, I put um, a Shaka Khan track into Logic a few weeks ago and tempo mapped it. It's all over the shop. Yeah. Feels but, gritty as anything. And you wouldn't listen yeah. to it and go, oh man, Steve Ferroni can't keep time. You no. just go, that feels really groovy. And, and I say it's all over the shop. You know, it's fluctuating between 98 and 104 over, yeah. over, you know, and various points in between. But that's what everybody is. And I think this is the problem with producing music in the modern era, building it up to a grid. Yeah. Because what you get is that natural tendency of somebody, you know, I'll get it with drum tracks. You can hear at the end of the end of the chorus, let's say, or, or the end of the, the end of a verse going into a chorus type section where there's a natural lift. So the drummer, 
plays his beat one slightly early, and then he straight away goes, oh, I'm slightly ahead. So beat two sounds like it's dragged. Yeah. It's like, well, if you didn't have that grid, you'd just play it. It's interesting because Baron Boyne talked about that hugely. He, used to, he gave the, I think it was the Reef Lectures actually that he was giving one year. Um, and he talked about the opening of Tristan Isolde as a prime example of where he's almost saying the idea that actually you, you have your, your sense of time almost has to be over 30 seconds or it has to be over a minute. Mm. Now, if you're going to have a very slow down, you're going to, you're going to suddenly, you know, um, have, a, have a big, written other or anything like that, you then will accelerate through the next bit. So he said it's this whole idea of stolen time or borrowed time. Mm. Whatever you borrow from one place, you have to give back somewhere else. But the yeah. idea that you actually keep it all strictly mm. thingy um, isn't necessarily the way. And I think, I think actually probably a lot of those things, you'll hear a natural fluctuation, but there is no, there is no problem with that. Mm. Funny enough, I was, on, I was on hold the other day and um, there was a, a piece of Debussy playing as the hold music, mm. as a mid-file. Oh. <laughs> and I, I mean, it was the most insufferable thing I think I ever had to listen to. You know, it was much worse than just having a little bit of elevator music or something like that. Because at least you know, well, I know what I'm listening to now, you know. But, but hearing this thing go on and on and on and on in this perfectly... <laughs> absolutely awful so uh, um now the other thing i was going to obviously not being a bass player myself mm. um, it was interesting to hear obviously you who are a bass player as well as a guitarist approaching that and obviously actually putting some bass solos on the ep mm. and actually, the bass solos have quite a different character to the guitar solos. I mean, I find on the rare occasions I do play bass, I basically just sound like I'm playing the guitar with a slightly thicker down the octave tone, you know, right. like yeah. the tone yeah. But you always seem to have a different vocabulary for bass than for guitar. Again, I'm going to ask an obvious bit, conscious decision, or do you think that came out of the technique of playing? Or It's, it's basically limited. It's because of my technical limitations, actually. Right. I mean, I can, yeah, I can sort of get around the thing all right. Um, but because I don't, I don't really have any muscle memory. I, right. When I improvise on the bass, it's a bit like how I would improvise on the piano. Right. There's no vocabulary built in. Well, there is because of obviously, but it's a different kind of vocabulary because I can't use the, 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 the interval of a third that yes. you get on a guitar. Sure. So a lot, a lot of my vocabulary is based around that third interval I've come to realize. Okay. Even if I've transferred it down a string, yeah, I find that that third actually gives. I think by not having that there, I think my vocabulary be obviously becomes more fourth based. But there is yeah. lots of but there's lots of triadic stuff as well. Yeah. So I think I probably just have to consider what I'm going to play a bit more on the bass, which is a good thing. Yeah. So consequently. You know, I don't, I mean, I can, I can play continuously and I mean that in a bad way, um, mm. if I'm not careful, but because of, I have to move position more, I have to take more breaths, I think. Yeah. And I think that's what it is. I think it's because of I'm having to move position more means that you just have to be a bit more considerate of what you're going to play. Um, and I don't really have much of a sense of self, you know, or a sense of ego, I guess, on the bass. I don't feel like I'm, I don't think I'm trying to prove any points. It's just like, I'm just trying to do something, play something that sounds musical. Yeah. I don't consciously play guitar with an ego, but I know it's there. Does that make sense? Of course. Of course. I mean, there must be some, I often, I find there's a little voice in the back of my head as I'm playing a solo saying, put one of those semi-quaver runs in, put one of those mm. semi-quaver runs in. Yeah, yeah. Quite nice when you're playing another instrument to think I can't do one of those over so I don't have to worry about that. I can actually yeah. play something else instead. You know, so. Yeah. I mean, I'm not even, I, I, I think I've be, I've got, you know, such a, an embedded guitar vocabulary, which isn't necessarily playable on the bass. Yes. And I just have to, you, I just have to use my intellect, I think. Yeah. And I don't have the technical facility to really nail it particularly well, but by the same token, I'm not trying to play anything that's so complicated that I'm going to nail it badly. 
you know yes. it's all going to be within my capabilities and assuming that i've been doing a bit of bass playing and i'm warmed up i couldn't if i hadn't played bass for six weeks and then try and play a solo it's going to be rubbish but if i'm in the middle of making an album i've been playing the bass quite a lot um even just you know even just practicing even just nailing the, the parts and the grooves will yeah. feed into the way that i could that i um then try and deliver i mean you know I, the thing is i think although i'm not known as a bass player professionally really um it's always been at the center of my musical world that's the funny thing yeah. i could have i could have gone that way yeah at some point in my life and part of me thinks maybe i should have done um but but i could i could have gone that way but if I'd have gone that way, I would be a totally different bass player to the bass player that I am. Of course, of course. And and I think if I'd have gone the other way, I guess maybe I wouldn't have such a like sort of my own character on the thing. Yeah, um, yeah. So I I hear my influences. I hear I think I hear my broader musical influences in my bass playing. If that makes any sense. Sure. Yeah, I think it does. Well, actually, that actually was my last question was just I mean you did touch upon it earlier on but it's this when you're recording multiple lines like you are and you've got quite a lot of acoustic on it you've got quite a lot of electric rhythm parts you've got quite a lot of harmony parts mm. just this balance between improvisation and composition you know how much of a, a concrete idea do you have in your head before starting each tune or did they completely emerge from the right so sunrise was basically improvised and then I had to work out what the harmonies were to add yep. the bass and acoustics. Um, uh, Sunspots, I sort of explained how I created that first half. Yeah, the, middle sec the middle section was, I don't know, it came out of, out of the air. I mean, it was one of the most moments. I thought I got that three note figure yep. and I thought, and it was, I thought, all right, well, that's like a D minor ad nine thing. Uh, what chord will I go to next? Oh, B flat minor. Oh, that sounds quite spooky. And, and then I just worked, you know, just moved to single voices. Yeah, and then yeah. it was a cycle. Um, so that, that was, that was kind of how that came about. Um, and then I just thought about ways to, to orchestrate, you know, with the Ebo orchestra and stuff under that, just because yeah. it needed to sound spooky. So <laughs> that's why I did that. Um, and I think the, uh, yeah, I, I sort of, the Eclipse acoustic arpeggios things was an exercise which I'd worked out as a picking exercise. And I just thought, oh, I think I'll turn this into a piece. And, sure. um, and then just developed. Not as obvious sort of pastiches, but there seemed to be, to me, the opening of Eclipse reminded me a lot of some of that, some of the Maya Vishnu, um, Peter and McLaughlin used to do a lot of those quite wide yes arpeggios as a way of building things up there's the album that he did with Cosmo Thomas was was like that and there were a few others earlier on and then I think I mentioned to you ages ago I heard quite a lot of the sort of Pat Metheny Steve Reich um, yeah at the point sort of influence in the middle section of that which I'm not sure whether you actually said you'd even thought of at the time it, it's all those influences that you mentioned were not actually influences although yeah. i although i was aware in particular i was aware of the um it's very dark i was aware very much of the um the fact that the electric counterpoint thing might be seen as a point of reference in the same way that some king crimson stuff might be seen as yeah. a point of reference like discipline well, I, think, I suppose that distorted bass at the start sounded very John, you know that, that red album by king crimson yeah i don't actually know that album but um but but the um the the sort of counterpointy stuff um yeah. there's 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 quite a lot of stuff on discipline that sounds like that um so um so i was aware of those as influences but i did it I, I actually did that consciously because what I was trying to do was try and create a musical. This is, I never think like this normally, but I was trying to create a musical picture of an eclipse happening. Got you. So hence the sort of things being out of sync and sort of coming into sync and then going out of sync again. That was the yeah. idea of, and that's why when it gets to the, got to the, get to the end of that section and then you've got the big strummy chord and all that yeah. and the repeated high notes and all that, all yeah. that kind of, that's supposed to be like the, the point of the eclipse, I suppose. 
yeah. and then and then it passes and then it goes yeah. back to peacefulness again. I mean, having experienced a total eclipse myself, I know what it's like to actually be at a total eclipse. Sure. So, um, uh, yeah, I was just trying to get a bit of that. Yeah. I, I mean, suppose, yeah. if you're going to use metric modulation as your sort of vehicle to, to realise that, you're going to end up with something, and you're doing it on a guitar, you're going to end up with something that sounds slightly Steve Reich. -y. Yeah. And, and to be honest with you, I just thought, yeah, I know it might sound like that, but I'm not purposefully referencing any of that stuff. I'm no. actually going for a, an effect, which, which is kind of the central point of the piece. I mean, the, the whole thing is, I mean, it, it's, you know, it's not actually a secret, but you might not realize this, but the reason I called the whole thing eclipse was, um, because I was writing it in the middle of the coronavirus, the, 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 the ring of light in an eclipse is called the Corona, isn't it? Ah, uh, yes. So, but I thought I'm not going to, I'm not going to do a thing named after coronavirus. I just thought I'm going to use the, the concept of the eclipse yeah. and the interaction between the sun and the moon and the interaction between the sun and the earth and the energy from the sun is kind of going to be what the, the, the concept of this, and I, you know, this is never how I think about writing music ever in my life, but this is, I don't know. Um, it was quite, I have to say that the whole process, I think um, I was feeling very, like all of us, feeling very, very unsettled and very fearful at the time and like experiencing rather uh, a state of existential um, terror <laughs> in many respects. Yeah. Um, and I think it just made me approach things totally differently. Yeah, of then. course. Yeah. Well, that's been... Um... Sorry, I was just uh, distracted by a missed, uh, a missed thing there. Um, yeah, no, that's, that, that, that really does um, sort of answer that. It's funny because I was, I was saying about, you know, potential Corona playlists. Mm. Um, and I couldn't get further than that dreadful. There was a um, sort of mid-90s house track called The Rhythm of the Night by Corona. Right. Um, <laughs> maybe you remember, maybe you don't. Um, so, uh, and the only other thing I could think of constantly was my Sharona, which sounds a little bit like Corona. Yes, well, well, I walked I, past the pub in uh, past the pub in about late February, and there was somebody sat outside singing my Corona. Yeah, just, well, just when it was all kicking off, and I thought, oh yeah, funny, funny. And then I, th I thought, then I remember walking along thinking, is it funny? Yeah, because we were just before lockdown, and it was just like just before the world was going to stop, <laughs> and. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Yeah, strange, interesting. I know it's, it's a cliche when people say it's interesting times, but it's led to interesting times on a personal, artistic level, if nothing else. Yeah. So. Well, that's it. So, do you? Uh, what's? I suppose this is the next, the last thing I wanted to touch upon is just actually the process, actually of the the of recording something like this. And actually, what your vision for it is going forward in terms of, I mean, you've put it out on Bandcamp, it's on different places, it's how you actually go about the more practical administrative side of doing a release yourself and being in control of your own music in that way. Um, yeah. What's the... What, what's, what's the process there? Or, do you, or, or is it just simply, well, just get it up, get it out, move on? Basically, that was it. Because this was this was supposed this was supposed to be this really was supposed to be um, a project for the lockdown, mm. and I didn't want it to drag because I know from previous previous experience I know just how long this this process can go on if you're trying to put something together single handedly, and I just thought I have no intention of making this last any longer than it has to. Yeah, um, I put it out before I was ready to put it out. In, in, in truth, it wasn't really finished in my mind, but I just I just. I knew I'd run out of personal steam with it. And I thought, well, it's probably acceptable as it is. And yeah. I'm not going to bother going down the, down the streaming route. I'm not going to send it to the, um, the uh, distributor who put my other two albums out. I'll just, I'm just going to keep this as a band camp only thing. And if people want to check it out, then they can. And if they don't, then so be it. Um, it didn't, it wasn't exactly a costly album to, or EP to make, and it wasn't, no. and it, and it was one of the things that kept me active throughout the lockdown. Even yeah. though, even though I had to sort of um, juggle a gazillion other things domestically or whatever. Um, so yeah, 
it was it was it was a project that was supposed to be a quick project and i don't know whether i might do another ep or, or try and work on another whole album i've got outtakes from this library album that um sure. are possibly going to turn into something else but i, I just don't quite know how i'm going to go about it yet so um